<clears throat> All right, welcome back to the Fantasy Labs podcast. This is your host, Brian. I am here with uh, Jonathan Bales. Uh, we uh, have a couple pods here at, at Fantasy Labs. Now we do, you know, kind of slight breakdowns. We have the DFS roundtable with, uh, with Matt Freeman, and uh, we would definitely want to get back to some of the interviews that we started this pod with. Uh, we're actually going to have two interviews this week uh, to kind of restart that. And, and the first one is kind of an exciting one because we obviously have uh, co-founder Jonathan Bales here, and we're going to talk about some of the new and exciting stuff uh, coming for, for MLB season starting just you know, over a week or so. Uh, so, Jonathan, what's going on, man? Not much. Uh, excited to talk about the new MLB product. I'm really excited about it. Yeah, so let's let's jump right into it. Um, so uh, there, there's a lot of lot of big changes. Uh, so I definitely want to you know spend as much time as we can, kind of uh, you know talking about those and, and kind of how to use things. Obviously we're going to have tutorials and, and all that stuff. Right. Um, and, and, and people can, you know, we're going to have plenty of stuff to help people learn how to use all the new stuff. Yep. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so yeah, so let's kind of just go through the, uh, the different things that are, are different from last year. Uh, you know, obviously you know, we started uh, fantasy labs and our first sport was MLB, you know, that was kind of our first thing in our launch. And since then we've been through NFL, uh, you know, we now, been through almost a full season of NBA. We have PGA um, and, and kind of rounding back to, uh, to MLB uh, and, and got some new stuff. So, um, so John, let, let's kind of talk through. So, so what's new this year uh, for MLB at Fancy Labs? Yeah, there's a lot new. <clears throat> and this is our first opportunity to um, improve upon a sport that we've already created. So this is um, – we didn't, we didn't uh, have baseball on opening day last year. I think we launched it maybe – June, so it was midway through the season. Um, but this is our, our first opportunity to um, improve upon a sport with, that we're not actually launching. So I think we can do a lot of really cool things. Um, and so some of the things that are different, um, number one, we have really cool new data that we um, are working with a, a company called Baseball Info Solutions, who works with um, 23 MLB teams, and they also work with fan graphs to supply their data. Um, and so we can talk about that in a second, but some really cool batted, bo- batted ball profile and uh, velocity data that I think is going to be really useful for players. Um, we also have a lot of new um, park factor uh, data that we um, break down by handedness that I think people um, perhaps don't do. Um, so there's a lot of really cool stuff with, uh, with new analytics. Um, second thing that we are actually launching, um, it will be available for every sport. And so when MB or when MLB rolls around, um, next week, it'll also be available for, for NBA and PGA. And that's a, a new lineup builder. Um, and so the new lineup builder is sort of a combination of, um, a multi lineup generator models and trends all together where you can um, filter uh, players looking at you can pick which stats sort of matter to you and filter out different players Um, and then for MLB what's really cool is you can stack within it so you can pick a team or two teams Mm -hmm. and um, how many batters you want from those teams and stack and then you can create a template um, within the lineup builder and save that template so um, for example you might say I only want to create lineups with batters who hit one through six and with pitchers who have um, at least an 8.5 K per nine um, and will only return lineups with those players. So that's really um, cool and exciting. Um, Mm -hmm. Another really big thing is player news. So Justin fan is going to be heading up MLB player news. And if you follow NBA or fantasy labs, NBA Twitter, you know how um, good of a job that he does with, getting news out where we, we're the first to have almost every piece of news the first to react to news and it'll be the same way for MLB we will have lineups out before anybody um, and we will also have analysis and data-driven objective analysis um, before anybody as well so I'm really excited about the player news um, and then um, our lineups page that a lot of people used last year uh, is going to be uh, we're going to have a lot of the same stuff uh, like I said we're going to have the lineups out earlier and then we also have um, some extra data on there as well. So um, overall, I'm pretty excited about it. I think that there's a lot of upgrades coming. And um, I already thought that uh, MLB probably sets up the best of any sport for for us to model. I think it's a really nice sport. It fits well with Fantasy Labs. So 
with all of the new additions, I think it's going to be pretty useful. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, so, so let's kind of uh, you know talk about the data real quick before we kind of move on to some maybe the other features. Um, yeah, so so it's kind of the advanced metrics that you were talking about with baseball info solutions and uh, some of the batted ball statistics. So, can, can you kind of maybe give some examples uh, of those and maybe why they're useful? You know, what why why did we you know uh, pursue getting those in our models? Is it because they're more predictive? Uh, they're just kind of nice and cool to look at, or um, I, I assume that's probably the former. Yeah, ideally we want everything to help us make better predictions and to make more money. Sure. Um, so if something doesn't help us make money, it's not really that useful. So yeah, I think that the data is going to um, help make better predictions. So I guess I'll just run through um, the data that, that, that we have that's um, gonna be new that we're incorporating into models. Um, we break it up into um, running 12 months, which we call a year. So any, mm -hmm. any advanced stats, we have a category called advanced stats year, which is a player's running 12 month um, average. And then we have uh, running 15 day total. So recent performance. And for batters, we have um, batted ball distance, which might actually be my favorite thing that I think people don't look at that I found to be super predictive. Um, and we're looking at just the average distance that a ball travels. Um, we have the X, Y coordinates of every batted ball. And so we can easily, um, track batted ball distance. We have exit velocity, which people have been talking about um, quite a bit um, in the past couple of years, and that's uh, how fast the ball comes off of the bat. And um, obviously, you want you want batters who are hitting the ball really well and uh, at high velocity. We have um, hard hit data or hard hit percentages, which is um, we use that um, the velocity to categorize um, how uh, hard. Uh, Baseballs are hit, and um, uh, better batters are obviously hitting the ball harder, a high, uh, higher percentage of the time. Then we have batted ball profiles, uh, fly ball, ground ball, line drive percentages. Um, and this is something that I've talked about a lot. You want um, batters who are getting the ball into air. That's where upside comes in daily fantasy, and it's not properly priced into DFS salaries. So obviously fly ball and line drive hitters are better. They're gonna cost more overall, but um, the sites haven't uh, completely compensated for it. And so there's a lot of um, value there. Uh, and then we have differential stats. And this is where I think a lot of the value comes in. So uh, distance differential, which would be the difference between a batter's um, distance in the past 15 days as compared to the running 12 months. And what that does it is it helps us basically quantify um, luck. So uh, baseball is so high variance that batters are, a lot of times are, um, it's difficult to look at their stats, even advanced stats, and tell how well they're hitting the ball just because, you know, a guy could hit um, three shots to the warning track in a game and he's really crushing the ball or he hits line drives right at, right, right at guys and he gets out, out and um, something like ISO or WOBA, even those advanced stats aren't going to account for that, whereas batted ball velocity or distance will actually account for that. Um, so I think it's a good way to tell um, if batters are actually um, performing well of late. So we have those differentials for distance, exit velocity, and hard hit percentage. Um, and then on the pitcher side, we have all of those stats against, and then we also have um, just pitch velocity. So how hard they're throwing, um, and if you compare, you know, if a guy normally throws 93 and he's only throwing 91 his past three starts, that's valuable information that um, suggests that he's not really throwing the ball that well, or he might um, be hurt. And he's, you know, a lot of times um, before pitchers get injured, we see that drop in velocity. Interesting. Yeah. So, you know, there's so many stats in MLB, and and for beginners or even people who have been playing, you know, sometimes it can uh, honestly, just get a little overwhelming that, you know, like you've, you said, you know, there's, there's WOBA and there's ISO and you know, there's all sort of, you know, different statistics. Now we're introducing some more maybe advanced ones. Um, and it is interesting because, you know, you have stats um, and I kind of group them into two different categories, especially for DFS purposes, where you have, uh, you know, stats that are important and stats that are valuable. Um, and obviously, you know, we have stats that are important. Like we know K9 is really important for pitchers, right? Uh, we, we know that, you know, predicting strikeouts, especially in, you know, tournaments is something that we you know, really have to do and, and really important for pitchers in DFS. Um, but if everyone knows it, um, you know, 
we know it. Um, everyone in the contest knows it. That K nine is really important. Uh, you know, DraftKings and FanDuel or whatever site you're playing knows it and is perfectly priced in. I mean, it's still important, but it's not as useful. So, do you think that maybe the kind of the the really cool part about this data is not only is it important, but since you know no other site has it, I mean, we're talking uh, only you know a, a handful of MLB teams and Fangrass has the data that we have. Um, it, it's kind of impossible for it to uh, be fully valuable to the DFS community inside of because no one's using it. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good point, um, and I would agree with that completely. And there, are the, yeah, there are two ways that um, you can uh, gain value, or two ways that a stack can be useful. One is if it's not priced into DFS salaries, and I think there's pretty good evidence that things like battered ball profiles and average distance and velocity are not priced into salaries. There's no reason that sites would consider that since it's not part of public opinion. And the second part is that public opinion. So when you're in tournaments, um, something could be uh, not priced in by DraftKings or a guy could offer value, but if it's overcompensated for by the field, then there's no usable value in the tournament. And <clears throat> um, I know of maybe two DFS players that regularly use this data. So it's not going to be uh, a factor in ownership um, or else it wasn't a factor <laughs> in ownership. It might be a little bit now um, mm -hmm. with, with people using fantasy labs, but still I'm pretty sure there's going to be some meat left on the bone there where uh, this data is going to be really useful, I think. And uh, just, just testing it and looking at some um, situations, uh, just going back in, in, in uh, slates last year and trying to recreate them and, and create lineups um, without really knowing the outcomes, uh, it's it's produced some really cool results. So I'm excited. Yeah, so so obviously, you know, the new data is going to be um, in, in the models and you can um, you can adjust your sliders, kind of the same, same as it's been in, in all of our models and all of our sports. Same sort of with MLB last year, you know, if you – um, if you think that WOBA is really important or, or whatever, you can adjust that slider for batters. And we're going to have sliders for these, you know, new, new advanced stats as well. So you can, you know, factor them and make them a part of your model. I assume that they're going to be, uh, you know, in trends so people can, you know, really like dig in it and research, you know, just how valuable uh, and, and find some really cool um, historical stuff on this stuff, right? Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Going to be in trends. And we have a lot of different um, stats and trends. The sliders that will be in models are mostly going to be the differentials. And the reason that I think that that's more valuable is because, um, so if we look at a player's batted ball velocity over the course of a year, that's going to even out um, where it's, that will probably be priced into a player's salary just because better players are hitting the ball harder and it evens out and their salaries are higher. Um, over the course of uh, 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 15 days or, or 10 days or five games or whatever it is, or three starts for pitchers, um, the DraftKings and FanDuel don't properly price players um, because those stats don't have a chance to even out. So when you see um, Cargo, who last year hit the ball an average distance of 218 feet, um, and there was a time last year where over a 15-day period he was hitting it over 250 feet. So he had a huge differential, um, but he was actually getting out for whatever reason. He wasn't really actually playing much better, but he's hitting the ball really, really well. DraftKings, Vandal aren't going to compensate for that and will be able to tell that he's hitting the ball well. And so I think those differential stats are the most important, arguably, for models. Interesting. Uh, you know, one thing you mentioned before when you're kind of running through the new stuff is um, – so some new, new, newer things we're doing with park factors. Can you kind of dive into that a little bit and kind of what's new and what's exciting in that regard? Yeah, the park factors. So I think people just think of a park as um, it's just one static thing and it's just like everyone benefits in the same way and they shouldn't. And I think the main way that um, batters would be would differ based on the park is, is by handedness. Um, with lefties, obviously, generally hitting the ball to right field and, and, le and righties to left field, um, we should break down um, park factors by handedness. And so that's what we've done. Um, and so now there's a slider also for park factors. We didn't have that last year because I thought that you could recreate it. And I still think that you can without the actual park using Vegas and weather, um, mm -hmm. because I think that a lot of uh, what we consider park factors is actually the result of um, 
uh, weather factors, temperature and altitude being the most important ones. Um, it's not actually the park. If you were to look at solely the park, Coors is actually the worst park in the league for hitters. Yeah, it's, not good, yeah. it's like a massive park, and now they raise the walls. Um, and by the way, I heard some information that the raised walls at Coors will reduce runs by 1% but home runs by 6%. Hmm. Um, and I heard that from someone I trust. So um, I think that 6% number is pretty, pretty substantial. Hmm. Um, yes. But, and then um, for pitchers, one thing that we're doing this year that's different is um, predicting the probability of facing each hitter. So we have park factors for pitchers, hmm. um, but it's adjusted for the opposing lineup. So we wait, um, well, we predict the lineup. And then when the actual lineup is confirmed, um, we adjust. So if there's a bunch of lefties in the lineup that's unexpected, we would adjust for that if it's a, a good or bad park for lefties. Um, but then we also um, multiply each um, batter's uh, projection, if you want to call it that, or, or um, the park factor by the probability of um, uh, getting an at-bat. So I believe um, leadoff hitters see 12% of at-bats um, number two hitters, maybe 11.5%, something like that. Uh, so we're sort of, and we do the same thing with um, opposing Woba, which is a stat that we have that adjusts for the opposing lineup. Um, but obviously, the leadoff hitters, Woba, is going to be more important to the pitcher's projection than the nine hitter, True. the eight hitters, Woba, because he's more likely to face him in an extra at bat. So we're compensating for that this year, which I think is, is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that makes sense. Yeah, because before, you know, it was kind of just like, here's the team Woba that you're going against it, which uh, is a little flawed because you're right, because you're kind of waiting the nine hitter um, who could only get three bats, could be substituted out for a pinch hitter, as opposed to, you know, these one through five guys are the ones that are really going to get, you know, substantial at bats and, and have to battle this pitcher on kind of, a, a you know, a, a, the for the entire game, really. Um, so some kind of quick things I want to hit on before we, uh, I think maybe jump into just a little kind of, um, you know, DFS 101 strategy talk, um, widgets, obviously we're going to, you know, we launched those a couple weeks ago and they're going to be available for, for MLB as well. Yep. Yeah. The widgets will be available. Um, and so we have a uh, recent performance, um, player ratings and player news, which again is new for MLB that I'm really excited about. Mm -hmm. uh, I really can't emphasize enough how um, useful I think the MLB news is going to be with, with Justin running it. It's going to be really, really good. Um, and we will have lineups in before anyone else. I promise that. Uh, and then we are also adding a Vegas, a Vegas dashboard widget where you can see all of um, our Vegas data in one spot and then also um, line movement. And um, which you can see now, but it's a, it's a little difficult to find, I think. Um, and then betting percentages, reverse line movement, and things like that. Yeah, very underrated part of the site. Uh, also, it was also uh, Brian's idea, everybody. So that, that, was, uh, that was yours. Yeah, you know, we, will, we, we don't need to, to throw <laughs> credit around. But, you know, it was a brilliant idea. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. No, I'm excited about that uh, for sure. Because we have, we have really cool information. You know, we have, like, percentage of – uh, bets on the spread and percentage of bets on the over under and you can kind of see um, in money line and you can kind of see you know reverse line movements and in baseball I think you know whenever you have like extreme movement on something I think even particularly in baseball maybe more so than other sports it's really really important and we have this yeah. data and, and it's sometimes it's hard to, to kind of show that in, in a way that's useful to people and I think this is going to help yeah I was doing a tutorial today um, and uh, I looked at the it, i was doing something on models and i just looked at the the rockies um projection it moved up um a half a run even though they were only getting 40 percent of bets and that's a huge number to move up and i said oh this is a, a situation that i would probably target but i didn't know the results but i was looking at a past date so i could yeah. check it and they they scored 11 runs that game so that was uh that pretty was good pretty cool to see yeah, yeah. I mean, those reverse line trends. Yeah, uh, they're, they're really cool. And, and I, I do think this uh, this dashboard is going to be uh, really cool to kind of visualize all of that uh, on a daily basis for sure. Yeah, and the main reason that that's cool and because and that our, a lot of our data is cool is because it's in real time. So daily fantasy salaries are static. 
right? They, they are maybe efficient when they come out, but s there's so much new information, weather changes, there's line movement, um, lineup order changes. So we adjust pitcher stats because of that. A guy moves up from the six hole to number two, that's a big difference. Um, we adjust all these things in real time, and that's one of the big advantages of Fantasy Labs. So um, there is no such thing as static value. It's always changing, and we do our best to compensate for that. Yeah, I mean, even if DraftKings, you know, kind of perfectly prices everything, you know, if they perfectly price a lot of the important stats and perfectly price in Vegas, yeah, uh, unfortunately, they have to get their prices out a day before the contests start. So um, any new information obviously kind of gives value either negative or positive on that sort of salary. Um, yeah, that, that's a great point. Um, yeah, so if we move on this to strategy, kind of just uh, on my own, just want to uh, mention, you know, the sort of content, we're obviously going to have a lot of content, be it, um, you know, both evergreen, uh, we're obviously going to have a lot of strategy and, and that sort of thing, but also, uh, you know, podcasts and, and Slate Pacific breakdowns, we're going to have a written breakdown every day uh, this year, so that'll be out, you know, well in time for the Slate, and we'll also have a podcast uh, where we go over the Slate uh, in kind of a unique way, going over some of our cool data and stuff. I think it's going to be really good. Uh, that's going to be Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Uh, I'll be on it a lot. Uh, Jay, um, you know him from NBA pods a lot. He's going to be on it a lot. And we'll kind of have a rotating cast of characters. So I, I think that'll be really good uh, and, and excited about that for sure. Yeah, think, think NBA um, level uh, of intensity with the, uh, the content, the breakdowns, the news um, with uh, or for MLB, but with a lot of extras, advanced data, um, mm -hmm. lineups. There's just, it's going to be our best product that we have. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, I'm pretty stoked for MLB, actually. Um, so, yeah, so let's kind of dive into some strategies. So, so one thing that I, I think is a good question for you, Bales, is, uh, you know, you're, you're kind of a big name player in the MLB DFS world. So, um, you know, like providing this data and kind of having it on the side is great, but like practically, how are you going to use it? Like I assume obviously, you know, that you, you wouldn't do this if you didn't believe in the data and that it was going to be predictive and useful. Um, and everything so you know how is how is the new fantasy lab site going to change the way that you play dfs this year um well it changed how i played a lot last year just in making everything so much more efficient like i could create lineups in in uh, you know a fraction of the time maybe 20 percent of the time that it used to take me to do the same amount of research or even even less i mean it's um that was before the lineup builder. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just um, having all of this data and information in one place, uh, even outside of the tools, just having the data, being able to see these things and visualize them and um, visualize value in a very um, uh, efficient way is so valuable. Even on lineups page, something I didn't mention is we're going to have um, basically like team um, – team value. So uh, just comparing the overall cost of every batter in a lineup um, to the Vegas implied runs. Um, so it's just a very quick way to visualize the, the, the value that an entire team is offering or, or the filter that we now have in models where you can just click on a team um, and see every batter from that team as a way to um, potentially visualize the value of a particular stack. Um, mm. So just how efficient it is, is really useful. And then again, I'm really excited about the advanced data. Um, I've worked with that, created a couple models that incorporate that. Um, and the best way that I think to use that is actually going to be more on a, a case by case basis. I'm going to, I'm going to use it to model, but um, there's a lot of situations that just sort of jump out to you. The, the one that I mentioned, uh, I'm on September 3rd from last year. So you can go in the, the calendar that we have in models and go back there and look at cargo's differentials. And it's pretty crazy. An 11 percentage point difference in hard hit um, percentage, 28 foot um, differential in average distance. And this is over a, um, he played 13 games um, in this sample. That's a huge difference. Um, and, the, and those uh, things are, I think are, are really, really valuable and predictive. So it's just an NFL season pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. It is. So, um, yeah, I think that uh, that ability to just do things really, really quickly is um, one of the things that's most valuable to me. And then, um, of course, 
the main difference between fantasy labs and, uh, you know, there's a lot of um, great daily fantasy sites out there. Some have um, good um, content, uh, a couple of good uh, data or tools or whatever, but none really do a great job of um, proving that what they're doing is right. Um, and I think that's important to test everything that you're doing and we give you that ability to test. So you can immediately back test everything that you're doing. And if it's not going to be good, we can tell you immediately. You don't need to waste three months and lose a bunch of money to find out. Um, yeah. And new site does that. And it's really, really important to test everything that you're doing. And so the ability to immediately back test, I think, is invaluable. Um, and until another site does that, um, I don't really think that there's any other place that you would go for DFS um, data or tools. Yeah, I, I mean, even just like an example, you know, the trend of the day that we do for NBA, and we're going to do the same thing for MLB. We're going to have a trend of the day for MLB. You know, we, we show a trend that, you know, our riders or whoever it may be uh, finds interesting about this specific slate of the day. And, and then we, you know, provide, uh, you know, screenshots of how we're using the trends tool, how you can build this trend yourself. And then we give, ex you know, we, sh we show hard data on historically how this trend has fared and, and then you know what it kind of looks like for the slate yeah so it's not like a um like a you know not like we're putting out content that just says like hey this is a good spot for this guy trust me um yeah. it's this is a good spot for this guy let me show you why that's been the case historically why i think it's the case now um and, and kind of here's the data for today which yeah. i think is really cool and I think, yeah, uh, it's going to be really cool because we're going to incorporate a lot of that into news as well. And so I think that this is a really big inefficiency in Daily Fantasy, the ability to provide objective news. And we can do that um, because of the data and because of trends. So an example might be um, uh, the wind. It's really windy at Wrigley today. So everyone's saying to target um, particular hitters. But maybe, um, you know, we have a news blurb that uh, – when the wind is blowing, and I think this is, this is true, when the wind is blowing straight out to center at Wrigley, it plays incredibly. Like, you definitely want to target bats there. Um, when it's blowing across the field or to, like, right field, for example, um, it might not actually be that beneficial, especially if the other, um, if one of the teams has a bunch of righties. So if you have a bunch of righties and the wind's blowing out to right field, that's actually really not that beneficial for hitters. And so that might be a situation that you're fading. Um, especially because it's going to be higher ownership. <laughs> Yeah, potentially um, to be Andy Fragile, you might be targeting a pitcher in that situation, um, depending on there'll be a variety of factors that would go into it. But that's the type of news that we'll be um, providing that's really objective. And so it's not really, um, you know, this is one guy's opinion and you should trust him because even if it's if it's um, CSU Ram or Justin Fan in basketball, like who cares what they think? It's like, you know, who really cares? that You should be able to do your own um research and come to your own conclusions and so our goal is to provide the foundation um, in every aspect of the tools and news and data provide that foundation for you to make really good decisions on your own and so I hope to bring that to our MLB news yeah no I'm, I'm really excited about that as well um, you know one thing I think that's uh, different about MLB like you know if we have users who you know have played kind of got into fantasy laps on the NBA side um, potentially um and now we're kind of getting into you know our mlb product i think one thing they're going to find different uh, and kind of want to ask you your thoughts on this um is that they're going to see no projections for players um you know like we have projections every day for every nba player uh, and as a result you have like a stat called like projected plus minus where you can kind of you know, we can see where like what we expect a player to score and what we actually project them. You kind of see the difference and that's a good, pretty, pretty good ind indicator of value, uh, especially with, you know, how good our NBA guys are at our projections and minutes and usage and stuff. Uh, MLB though, we don't have projections. Um, you know, we have the data and we have stuff like that, but there's no like uh, we project my trap to score uh, eight points this game. Why no projections in MLB? Um, there's no projections because we can model it with the data very easily. So um, in NBA, Justin's projections are still created using a model, but we have the projections because it's very difficult for us to use a blind model and, and react to news, um, for example. So a guy gets scratched at 655, which happens all the time in NBA, mm -hmm. um, and we need to very quickly react to that. And so relying on a model at all times, I think, would be difficult 
um, in MBA. Um, and then also there's so many different situations in MBA, there, and, and especially football, different schemes, different personnel, um, that you really do need a human element to it. In baseball, um, it's very standardized. It's the same distance, pitcher to hitter. Um, not much changes. The parks change a bit, but we can quantify that. The weather changes, we can quantify that. The umpires change a bit, we can quantify that. Um, otherwise, it's very standardized. It's very binary. It's hitter versus pitcher. That's all it is. Um, and so it's, it's just much easier to uh, model with the stats that we have. And I think that that actually makes it um, – that adds to the product, I think, because you're basically creating the projection in a way. Um, you're creating it using all of the different stats and we just provide. We have, I think, every stat that you could possibly want now um, in a model. Um, so the ability to use that, weight it, um, to rate players as you'd like, effectively, that is your projection. Yeah, so so interesting. So you just kind of finish, you know, just want to finish with maybe just a little bit of strategy and maybe DO, DFS 101. Um, you know, so the, the stats that we have in our models and trends, um, you know, let's kind of just run through, you know, like obviously hitters and pitchers, you know, we know that there are some stats that are important. WOBA, K9, those are like the, the main things. Uh, are there going to be stats, maybe some of the newer ones that kind of not necessarily take the place, but are, are kind of equally important for you this year? You know, like if, if a new user's coming in and you're kind of guiding them towards statistics for those, uh, for hitters and pitchers, you know, wh wh where are you pushing them towards? It's still going to be a lot of basic stats that I think you just need to weight in the in the right way. And then, um, you know, you still need to make good subjective decisions. Um, you know, you have your model that, that is objective and it uh, provides ratings for players. Um, but it would be a mistake, I think, to blindly trust it. You still need to make good subjective. Um, they can be data driven, but they still need to get, be good subjective decisions. Um, and that's where I would use a lot of the um, velocity data and things like that. But still, nothing is going to be – in baseball, number one by far is going to be Vegas. It's just so important because baseball is such a, a holistic game. It's so um, – the, the success of an individual is so tied to that of his team. A batter – there's no cannibalization that we see in football. Every touchdown in football um, – for a player's teammate is bad for him. Every single one. Um, mm -hmm. Every point scored in NBA is bad for the teammate, any teammate that didn't score a point. Um, it's just, there's only a certain number of points to go around because the games are timed. Um, there is no theoretical cap on points scored in fantasy baseball. A team could theoretically score a hundred runs in a game. There's no cap. So every thing that it happens that's good for one player is good for everyone else even um fifth inning two outs the number eight hitter gets on base and then the number nine hitter gets out that that hit by the number eight hitter was still good because it increases the probability that um other his teammates see an extra at bat in the game um so everything is that's good for one player is good for every one of his teammates and because of that the vegas lines because of those correlational effects the vegas lines are super super important because those are giving um, a sense of uh, a team's projection or upside in a given game. And because the individual is so linked to that, it's a really good um, predictor of success at the individual level. Um, we can, um, we can uh, isolate uh, or, or predict pitcher strength, for example. When a, when a team is projected at 2.5 implied runs, we know they're facing an ace um, and things like that. So I think Vegas is going to be always the most important thing. Um, you mentioned WOBA. That's important. I prefer ISO. I think it was Mitch who did a yeah. recent article on this. It was an amazing uh, article. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome article. That. Um, so I think if you aren't into stats at all, you probably don't even know what WOBA and ISO are. WOBA is um, basically a catch-all statistic that measures overall batter value, more or less. Mm -hmm. ISO is isolated power. It's basically uh, a, a batter's ability to hit for power, hit um, for extra bases. Um, and the narrative within DFS, DFS players know these stats. Um, they typically have used ISO in tournaments as a gauge of upside and WOBA in cash games. And I think Mitch showed um, something that I agree with, that ISO might be the stat to use for both. Um, and the reason that I think that is because Every player, every batter in baseball has a, um, a low floor. Um, so Mike Trout can go 0 for 5 with three strikeouts, and that, that happens. Um, 
and he scores zero points. Um, but only certain players have a really high ceiling, Mike Trout being one of them. Um, mm. And so uh, the payoff, it, there's sort of an asymmetrical balance in, in, in scoring. And so you want those guys who have access to those really high ceilings. And those are typically guys who have really high um, ISOs. Um, they're particularly the ISO splits. So they're ISO against uh, lefty or, or, or righty, whoever they're facing. Um, so I think that ISO is probably going to be a better stat for daily fantasy than, than WOBA. Um, on the hitter side, also weather um, and our weather rating, I think is really, really valuable. Um, that, that was actually my, what I thought was my edge um, when I started playing DFS. I did all of this research on weather and I actually had seen a study from um, some statisticians and a meteorologist on on how important it was, and I thought that people weren't utilizing it. Uh, and the temperature, everyone knows um, cores, obviously, the altitude, um, but there's al some altitude at, at um, other parks, and then the temperature is really, really important. So Globe Life in Arlington, for example, is a hitter's park, um, but really only because of the temperature. So when it's 75 degrees there um, in the beginning of the year, it doesn't really play that well for hitters, and that's a situation to potentially exploit by... Um, do you think, is, is that captured in Vegas, or do you think there's an inefficiency there? It's not It's not captured in Vegas um, from what I've seen. Hmm. Yeah, um, same thing with uh, yeah, uh, Safeco is another example. Um, usually very mild in Seattle, but when it does get hot... Um, it plays actually pretty well for, for batters. Um, and the other thing is, even if Vegas were sort of um, adjusting for it a bit, it's not going to properly capture upside, which is what we really want. So the narrative would be don't, you, you know, very rarely do people stack at Safeco and rarely do they target a pitcher at Globe Life in the middle of the summer or something. Um, but maybe the temperature's down or maybe the temperature's up in Seattle and that's a situation that you want to go after because there's more upside there than um, even Vegas is accounting for. So weather for batters um, and then batting order, of course, um, and, and one through five. If you're playing cash games, you really want to stick to guys that are hitting really high in the order. Um, Vegas for pitchers, I'll just go through this really quickly. K for nine that we talked about. I still think um, I still think uh, K for nine is, is going to be really valuable. You just... Mm -hmm especially in draft games, need strikeout potential. Mm -hmm. um, and then for pitchers, um, recent performance, I think, is, is pretty valuable. Um, so those uh, velocity numbers and the hard hit data and, that, and the battered ball velocity against and those things, the average distance uh, against pitchers who um, aren't giving up hard contact uh, over the past three starts or so, I think that stuff's going to be pretty valuable um, for pitchers because they have a larger sample size. Uh, uh, game to game, we have 100 pitches, and so we can. The, the results are more um, a reflection of how they're actually playing, um, and so uh, I think that recent performance, whereas we don't value it potentially at all for batters or just minimally, um, it's a bigger factor for pitchers than maybe some uh, data nerds would would uh, <laughs> would would, would uh, agree with. I, I'm pretty pretty uh, bullish on recent um, performance for pitchers. Interesting. Yeah. And one, one thing that you mentioned just a little bit ago was, you know, the, the, you know, trying to differentiate stats in between, you know, cash game and, and, uh, and, and tournaments. And I think that it's, it's interesting because, you know, like, you know, we're very just kind of into NBA, or at least I am just because, you know, we've been doing it for months now. So it's kind of hard to like train your brain into thinking about MLB uh, as opposed to NBA and, you know, NBA, obviously, you know, we have, uh, you know, guys that we, you know, we have a floor and ceiling projection for each player in our models. And, you know, in cash, we obviously want to focus on players with a safe floor. And in tournaments, we obviously want to get guys with high ceiling. But that's interesting that you're saying. So it's almost like because there's no floor, um, like you might as well just disregard it as something that you find important, you know, because like Mike Trout and, and Goldsmith and, and um, whoever, Bryce Harper, whoever the great batters are, you know, just because they have just as, uh, as low of a floor, even though they're probably a little more consistent with it, uh, you might as well get upside where you can um, just because there's, you know, just because the floor is zero for everyone's really. Yep. Then that goes with individual player selection and then also with um, team construction. So I think that stacking is not done nearly enough in cash games. I think people are, say, oh, it's too much risk to take on, don't stack. I definitely think you should stack, and I think you should stack heavily in cash games. 
So, yeah, let's let's dive into that before we finish up. It'll be kind of the last thing we touch on. Um, obviously, you know, DraftKings and, and FanDuel had some rule changes. Um, I think DraftKings is probably the, maybe the more publicized one because there's rule changes affected stacking. Um, FanDuel's actually, you know, changed actually some of their numbers and scoring. So I think that actually might be a little more drastic in terms of like changing, uh, you know, how things you know, go on, on Fandle, but uh, I, I wanted to get your thoughts on, you know, I, I think it's interesting in, in NFL, you know, we talked on, on podcasts, especially, you know, you and I were in our uh, NFL podcast every week. Um, you know, it just seemed like game theory was changing a little bit. You know, we had all these heuristics that, uh, you know, you never, you, you know, in, in a tournament, you want to find a quarterback with the, his number one wide receiver. Like that's just, that's where you start. And then, you know, figure out the rest and hopefully you can win a million dollars. That was just the rule of how to play. Uh, and then we saw, you know, a guy stack a quarterback, uh, two wide receivers, what a, a running back, a tight end and a defense for the Steelers and yeah. win a million dollars. And just kind of like to say, you know, screw uh, correlations. I'm just going to win a million dollars with these things. So it just seems like kind of game theory. And, and I think there's a little bit in, in NBA this year as well. It's just game theory is kind of changing. Maybe it's because, you know, the DFS community is getting a little smarter. Maybe um, there's just different inefficiencies now. I mean, it's kind of a zero-sum game, and obviously that affects the market. Uh, I'm curious your, your thoughts on that, especially with the rule changes. Do you think game theory is going to change a lot this year for MLB? Um, I, yeah, I do think it's going to change. Uh, I think a lot of the changes were going to happen anyway. Um, mm-hmm where even two years ago, we didn't see sta- we didn't see stacking across the board at all. Um, if you stacked every moderately to and low-owned offense, you were probably going to be profitable. Um, I don't know if that's the case anymore. I still think that the ownership on the chalk is too high. Um, but what I do think is going to happen, and I didn't initially think this, but then I, um, I saw some people on Twitter talk about it, I thought about it, and I, I do think it's going to be true is – I think that the the five man max and the two team minimum is going to increase lineup overlap where we're going to see a lot of five three stacks and we're going to see a lot of five stacks with um, just one through five hitters. Um, yep. because people, I think, know that there's a drop off after number five. Um, there's a drop off at, at the six hitter. They're going to go one through five. And so Rockies are at home, them and their opponent one through five stack is going to be through the roof. Um, I think it also is more palatable to stack five players for most people um, where six was a lot. So there was a lot of five man anyway. um, And then some more differentiation, but now everyone's just going to, I not everyone, but there's going to be a lot more just one through five stacks because it's just easier. I think to stack five batters where uh, there's a psychological hurdle similar to what you mentioned with the Steelers example where, okay, all these guys can't go off. Um, and it's like, yeah, the, the probability that they all do is very low, but the probability that you don't stack and win with like the perfect combination is also very, very low and probably, arguably, yeah. arguably much lower. Um, so yeah, I think that uh, because of how much easier it is to accept that, that five man stack, we will see greater lineup overlap which I think is good for me. Yeah, as a tournament player. Yeah. <laughs> Not just tournament, but there's tournament players who are chalky. And then um, like CSU is really obviously um, an amazing player and profitable, but, and he plays it uh, different than I, than I play with, with probably um, more chalk and he cashes at a higher rate than I do. Um, and I play a super contrarian style that sets up. Um, obviously he's going to be, he's better at every sport, but uh, much better at um, even relatively speaking at, at something like basketball, um, whereas I'm awful at NBA. Um, and then my best sport um, that maybe is, I don't know, is worst sport or I don't know what it is, but uh, is going to be MLB because of um, the randomness and the fact that being contrarian sets up really well for the sport. So, yeah. And, think, and more so this year is what you're saying. Yeah, more so this year. So I think it's going to help. Um, I think it's going to help contrarian players the thing is we're going to see more of those it's become like uh you know pretty common to try to be contrarian so you need to be you know there's no set way to be contrarian being contrarian um using game theory is something that's just like a foundation of how you think but what you actually do should change based on how others are thinking um so i think that 
for the most part this year, I'm, I'm still going to stack, uh, generally going to stack some offenses that I think that other people are too afraid to stack. Um, but I'm also going to not stack. Um, I think that being in the middle is potentially the worst spot, so you won't see too many 4-4 um, lineups from me or 4-3-1 or, or things like that. Um, We're kind middle, of hedging, yeah. Yeah, I think it's going to be a, a five-man stack or or um, or no stack. And with no stack, the idea is, and I like to do those in small and medium slates um, where there's not a great probability that an offense goes off. So if you have um, – four or five, six game slate, um, you could easily see a team that doesn't score eight or nine, even nine runs. Um, and so when that happens, no stack is going to score a huge amount of points. Um, and then you can be the, the beneficiary of that. So um, I think maybe it'll be at a 75, 80% of my tournament lamps are going to be full stacks and then the rest potentially not stacking at all, but we'll, we'll see. I mean, um, you know, it's uh, everything's subject to change and, and uh, everything changes so quickly. I think you just always need to adapt. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of a marketplace, obviously. You know, we've talked about the DFS market and, and that's kind of just how it is. Like there, there's, I think there's always an edge for, for people, but, uh, you know, it's going to continually change. Like as, as people recognize an edge, it's almost like, um, you know, people are going to flock towards, you know, what they think is the edge and then it's going to create, um, you know, an inefficiency. Um, you know, elsewhere. It's almost like a blanket that's too small for a bed. You kind of pull it to one side and it exposes another side. So, uh, yeah, so so maybe you know, a no stack or, you know, you know, different ways it's going to be profitable. And, and I think it's probably hard to predict exactly, you know, what that's going to be, you know, at, um, you know, late March at the, where we're recording this pod. You know, you know, we could be talking in June and say, wow, we're really wrong. I'm predicting that that sort of way that it's going, the game theory is going to evolve. But uh, I guess the point is that it's always going to evolve and you kind of have to uh, stay open to that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's uh, the entire um, philosophy. So what's, um, what was uh, something that was just dumb even a year or two ago could be a really smart contrarian play now or something that was contrarian then and really profitable um, could just be, you know, complete chalk now. So um, it really is, um, there's no single strategy that is like absolutely contrarian. It's, um, it's always a, um, a reaction to what other people are doing and uh, inefficiencies in the way that they're thinking. Yeah. And, and um, it kind of seems like there's going to be like an, an even bigger edge, you know, at the beginning of the year, not only are we going to have, um, brand new data that no one has, but people are going to be kind of adjusting on the fly to these new rules. So it, I, I, I'm pretty excited because I think, you know, Fantasy Labs users are going to be, you know, have a pretty nice edge um, in compared to the field uh, just because it's going to be, it's going to be weird opening to the season. I feel like with, you know, uh, with the rule changes and kind of just how NBA and NFL has gone. Plus we have new data and it's going to be interesting, I think. The start of the season is always the, the most interesting, always has been the most profitable for me. I think that's where the edge is for someone who is not necessarily trying to out-predict people in terms of performance, but instead trying to um, out-predict people in terms of ownership and, yep. um, and things like that. So that, that's – especially it's, it's difficult to predict in the beginning of the year. So if everyone's just trying to predict on-field performance and looking at last year's stats – you see a whole lot of what looks like randomness. It's probably not even randomness. It's just things change. Um, so there's, there's just a lot of money to be made in the first month of the season. Yeah, and we have some huge tournaments right away on you know a variety of sites. So, yeah, uh, definitely a good time uh, to get into MLB. We're going to um, you know put out this podcast. Obviously, we're going to have – ton of tutorials uh, all over the site on how to use our new stuff um you know content coming up news is going to start up really soon as well so uh we have a million different ways that you can kind of get into uh mlb at uh at fantasy labs and, and try it out for um you know at the beginning of the season and uh you know hopefully you like it uh jonathan thanks for co-founder of fantasy lab jonathan bales thank you for coming on the fantasy labs podcast yeah. i appreciate you being a guest on the fantasy labs podcast thanks so much for asking me <laughs> <laughs> it was an honor it is an honor for you i agree uh cool all right we will end it there uh thanks again a any last words for the fantasy labs community bales any any words of wisdom um 
No. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Goodbye. Cool. All right. All right. Thanks for listening, guys. Uh, yeah, we have a, another uh, interview coming this week. And obviously, you know, we'll continue uh, NBA and PGA. Uh, and then we'll start podcasts. And we'll be starting next week. So uh, thanks for listening. And uh, we'll talk to you guys down the road.